Welcome to our Bible class this morning. Today we're starting a new series on the book of 1 Peter. And so if you have a Bible, if you'd like to turn there, you can join me during that time. Have you ever found yourself as a stranger in a strange place? 20 years ago, I was in Vilnius, Lithuania, and I decided to take a walk. Now, I had been there for a week or so, and I kind of felt like I was familiar with things. And I was counting on my ability to be able to navigate much easier than I really should have. And my comfortability led me to do something really foolish. I got lost. I began to wonder where I was. I was all over the map, it seemed like. I kept passing things over and over again. And this sense of anxiety arose because suddenly I realized one simple thing. I didn't speak the language. All the street signs were in a different language. If I stopped to ask someone, they wouldn't speak English. I finally wandered around long enough to where I finally began to find out where I was and I knew what to do next. I found something familiar. That's the sensation that Peter describes in his first letter. How do you live as a stranger in a strange land? And so in the introduction to this book, Peter sounds all the themes that will contribute to living for Christ in an alien culture. But before we get into the details, let's zoom out a little bit to get an overview of 1 Peter. The very first verse gives us who wrote it and to whom it was written, but also a very interesting detail. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. By the title, Peter the Apostle of Pentecost is the author. Now, this is disputed by a few, but those theories that they have proposed are lacking in many things. So Peter brings his background to describe what following Jesus looks like. He was one of the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. He was there on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was there in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was there in the Garden when he was sentenced to death. And he's lived his life and he's probably in the twilight of his life now. And he writes these le his letter to the elect exiles in the province of Asia Minor. It was a region that Paul and Barnabas seeded with the gospel in their first missionary journey. And from Acts it tells us that this is where Paul took a very assertive approach to the Jews, that the Gentiles could be saved simply through the blood of Christ, without having to comply with Jewish law and custom. As he made more converts, the Jews ramped up their persecution. And therefore, this letter, when you read it, it appeals to Gentile people. It lacks the Jewish flavor we met in James. And it applies to people who've always been on the outside looking in. And Peter is the perfect spokesman for that. He's the one who crossed the Gentile threshold in the church for the first time when he goes to Cornelius' house sent by God. This is how hard it was and the lesson that God taught him. Listen to what Luke, how Luke records it. He said to him, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should call, not call anyone impure or unclean. It was then, then with some slips in the future, that sealed Paul, Peter's desire that the Gentiles should be saved. They were not unclean or impure. Jesus died for them as well. And the background of the book is the spreading persecution of Christians. In 64 AD, Nero, uh, the emperor of Rome, attempted to clear the slums of Rome by having henchmen set fire to them in the middle of the night. However, the wind shifted, and the wind shifted, it blew the fire into the, the more well-heeled districts of town, the wealthier parts of town. And then the hue and cry came up, and heads were about to roll, and like any good politician, he shifted the blame. The Christians, those mysterious people over there, those people who have things called love feasts, who call themselves brothers and sisters, who drink blood and eat flesh, they were the perfect fall guys. And from that moment, that growing wave of persecution began to roll through the empire. 
and it appears that it had not quite reached Asia Minor yet. But we would know that within a generation, it would become widespread. And this is a good hint that the letter probably was written somewhere around 67 AD, shortly before the death of Peter. Peter uses a term which would become a thread through the book, exile. Verse 1, he said, You are the elect, the exiles scattered throughout the province of, of Asia. The word means to live alongside. It denotes living in a place that, where you have an allegiance for home, but not this place. Now, they were exiles in one way. In 54 AD, Claudius expelled all the, the, the Jews, and he didn't make any differentiation between Christians and Jews. He expelled them all from Rome for being troublemakers, and they went elsewhere, and some of them went somewhere else. Many of, many of the, the Jews who lived in that province uh, and the others who had come were, were people who had come there during the, of, of a terrible emperor before the, de the birth of Christ. And so these were possibly physically exiled, but these were probably more the spiritual exiles. They were living in a foreign world because it's foreign to their values. I want you to think about this. What Peter says is we are exiles living in this world. We live alongside others, but our allegiance, our heart, our desire belongs to the Lord. And our hope is not found here in making this a better world, but in somewhere else going to heaven. That's what marks people of faith. And the Hebrew writer captures the essence of exile and the exile thinking that Peter is trying to express. Hebrews chapter 11, 13 says, These all died in faith, not having received what was promised, but having seen it and greeted it from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. During the Second World War, there was a group of German refugees who settled in Boston. They came there to escape Hitler's oppression. And on Sundays, late in the afternoon, when no one was using it, they would assemble in the chapel on Harvard University Square. The students walking across the camp on a sunny, warm afternoon would hear voices singing in German, a song written by Martin Luther. A mighty fortress is our God. They were singing songs both of faith and of home. And isn't that what we do as well? How do you live as a stranger in a strange land? How do we maintain faith in a world that acts antagonistic to it? Peter, in the preface of this letter, does four things to bolster their ability to live the exilic life. The first, he reminds them of their identity. Who are you? Now that's not an idle question, because the truth is whoever we see ourselves to be will determine how we live our lives. For instance, if we have the identity of someone who cares about our health, we, we will have the tendency to eat healthier food, we'll get more exercise, We'll see the doctor for regular visits and checkups. And the actions will create the identity, but the identity creates the actions at the same time. Think about the Gentiles, what they've always heard about themselves. The Jews, who were always their opponents, which is what, out of what Christianity flowed, believed that Gentiles were mongrel dogs, not worthy of attention or care. Jews believed, as Jonah showed, that God had absolutely no use for them because the Jews were God's chosen people. And as one Jewish writer of the first century put it, the Gentiles fuel the fires of hell. Peter flips all of this. When Christ came, the chosenness was not through ancestry, but through the grace of God displayed on the cross. So he tells these people, 
who have been chosen, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to be obedient to the Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. Grace and be, peace be yours in abundance. Oh, the words stand as monuments of God's action toward humanity. Don't read too much into them. Don't read more than, than what Peter intends for them to say. That term foreknowledge is easily under, misunderstood, meaning you think that God rendered some sort of a eternal lottery where ping pong balls popped up and if your name was on one of the lucky ones, you were saved. And it made very little difference what you thought or how you acted or anything else. But the term foreknowledge is our English word prognosis, and we know what that means. A prognosis simply means what is seen beforehand of what could be. It's not a determinant. A prognosis is not the disease, it's how we see it. God didn't run a lottery. He didn't select people at random. And that kind of thinking is kind of an affront to a powerful God who had a plan from the beginning. And that he gave a son so that anyone who believed on him would not perish, as John would say. The words, though, echo with the Old Testament. God uses them to describe Israel. They were holy, or a set-aside people. Deuteronomy 14 said, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Hold on to that. We'll meet it again in this book. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be a treasured possession. He chose them despite themselves. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, Israel, my chosen, Isaiah says in Isaiah 54, I summon you by name and bestow upon you the title of honor. But then he says to the Jews, even though you don't acknowledge me. And then Peter says that they were sprinkled again. This is the Old Testament illusion, not a stat sacral one that came many years after Peter wrote, but one em embodied with the, the grace of God. Because you see, the Old Testament describes only three times when someone sprinkled. Leviticus 14 says, when a leper is cleansed, when a covenant is sealed, according to Exodus 24, and when a priest is consecrated, in Exodus 29. These are holy moments. Ones of cleansing, of sacred importance, of relationship, of binding together in ways that cannot be taken apart. In short, Peter says, you are consecrated to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Their identity, these Gentiles, these mongrel dogs, these who fuel the fires of hell, according to the Jews, their identity is God's chosen people based on grace, not their ethnicity. Their obedience is a testament to God's grace shown in their lives. But the second thing that Peter does is he reminds them of their destiny. If you're chosen people, what's in store for you? He says in verse 3, Praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. They have been born into something. Through the water of baptism God has given them birth to what Peter calls a living hope. What makes hope living? You know, people can hope in a lot of empty things. They can buy houses that they believe will give them joy and comfort. But then the honeydews begin to pile up and it steals their joy. Or a late night, late night fire.
turns it to the to cinder. There's nothing left. But he's talking about that this is a different kind of hope. Those are the kind of things that the hope that circumstances can destroy is not really true hope. It's a dead hope. Living hope is a hope that man cannot extinguish. You see, for people who are having their houses confiscated due to their faith and their lives put at peril, they need to know and they need to remember that whatever they lose, they have what is still most important. If you maintain your perspective in the midst of the trials of life, if you remember that no matter what happens in this life, the life God has in store for you is far greater. You can remain firm through, all, through anything. And he also tells them, though, that they're shielded by God's power through faith. Their constancy of faith in the face of tyranny that, that they face in their daily lives, God posts a guard for them. If they'll continue to, to, to trust Him, God's protecting them. He's protecting their future. He's protecting their souls. Their future life and hope is behind God's lock and key, as is ours, as we constantly trust and obey Him. But then the third thing He does, He tells them about a test that is coming. Now, for the last year, the term vaccine has become a very commonplace in our culture in our vocabulary. Even if you slept through biology class in high school, you now know what a vaccine is. But it's also become a political football, a misunderstood concept. Most vaccines are things that are small doses of a disease given to let your body's immune system build its own defenses against it. I remember when I was in elementary school, they, they lined us up and they shot us with a vaccine gun. And in that vial was a minuscule dose of the most dreaded disease of its time, polio. Polio had killed millions. It had left children maimed. I had an elder at one time who walked with a terrible limp. It wasn't from a war. It was from polio as a child. He never got over that. That one dose in my second grade year kept me and so many of the other people that I knew free of a dreaded disease that is now extinguished because of a vaccine. It kept us alive. And see, one of the things that Peter does is he vaccinates these people about what is coming. He has, wants to have a frank discussion about what is about to arrive on their doorstep. Because if you are prepared for it, if you get a small dose of it, you can stand a bigger problem. He says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in the praise, the glory, and the honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. It seems apparent from this passage that they have not quite faced the complete brunt of persecution yet. They had not felt the fire, but they could smell the smoke. And like James that we ex examined in our last class, Peter tells him of these trials, these experiences of life that act as, as a crucible. The fires of persecution for them, Peter says, will do, or Jane, Peter says is two things. One, it will reveal how genuine their faith is, but the other is it will perfect it and strengthen it and clarify it. He said, it's worth more than silver and gold. These things that are coming at you, they have a better they have more value to you than the things you think are valuable. Now the Gentiles would understand that concept. Perhaps many of them had been slaves and they had to use silver and gold to buy themselves out of their slavery to make themselves free. Here, 
the faith that will be tested, the faith that will be put in the furnace, the faith that will be endured is more valuable than even their earthly freedom was. There's a songwriter named Gungor who wrote a beautiful song called Beautiful Things that I think captures Peter's thoughts. All this pain, I wonder if I'll ever find my way. I wonder if my life can really change at all. All this earth, could it all that it all be lost be found? Could a garden come out of this ground at all? You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of dust. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of us. We want to avoid suffering for our faith if we can. But remember that suffering is not a scourge. It's not a punishment sent by God. It's a purifying experience to make our faith even pure and more precious. Keep that in mind. And if you do, you'll stand the pressure. But Peter will continue and say, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. As an eyewitness who walked with Jesus, he elevates his audience to a higher level. It's easy to love someone that you've experienced in the flesh. We love our mothers in a different way than we may say we love an ancestor we never met. Because the familiarity tends to ignite the love that we feel. But their faith was not based on the human notion of acquaintance, but the deeper sense of trust in Christ because He is the Christ. They never saw the miracles. They never stood in an empty tomb as Peter had. But they trusted Him even the more. And that kind of endurance brings a harvest of life to them in the end. It is this salvation He wants them to stand in awe of. And that's where his final reminder comes. He wants them to stand in wonder of the salvation they're going to experience. I think in one of the most sublime passages of the New Testament, hear the glories and the salvation that was the centerpiece of God's plan concerning the salvation. The prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come upon you searched intently and with greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when He predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look at these things. Throughout the centuries, the prophets preached God's message. They knew of something that was coming, but they didn't know it precisely. It was like they were looking through a gauze curtain to make out the face of a visitor. They could make out a form, but not the identity. They knew the general, but they didn't know the specific. They always had to speak in someday terms. They wish they could have known the date. They wish they could have said, this is when it's going to take place. It's like a man standing in a train station, knowing a train's going to come by. He doesn't have a train schedule to tell him when it's going to happen. They had certainty without the details of certainty. And Peter reminds them that the Isaiahs and Micahs and Hoseas preach God's message for which they are the benefactors. They gave up so much so that these Christians could enjoy the salvation of God that they proclaim so loudly. Then Peter raises the stakes. Even the angels, with what they knew, 
wish to know what you and I know. They yearn for a glimpse of the plan of God and the experience that we now have. Think about that for a moment. How privileged we are. In what position we have. The angels wanted to know what we experienced, but they couldn't because we had the experience. We can't even describe it to you. We think in terms of angels knowing so much more than we do, and they do in some way, but they don't know the freedom that comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are truly blessed, and we have access to things unknown for centuries. The secrets of God's treasury are available to us. And I think Peter may be asking them the question he's asking us. When the going gets tough, why would you want to throw these mysteries and these secrets and this treasury away? It's much more valuable than anything on earth. We are wanderers on planet earth. We live in houses. On this earth, we eat food that's produced by the earth. We enjoy the places we live, but our hearts are in a place far away. We long for a day when we go home. And our lives reflect that reality. Our values are not the same as this world's. We will always be strange. And we will always be picked on, if you will. Accept that. All exiles, strangers, and immigrants do. They never have the popular view of the culture that they live in. Others will oppose us. No one will understand us. And that's okay. Don't judge people too quickly. It's only because... They are not citizens in the kingdom. But we know where home really is. In 1942, a man named Louis Zamperini was in a B-24 Liberator bomber. It was ferrying across the Pacific when it crashed into the sea. For over 100 days, he and his fellow crew members who survived lived on raw fish. They caught seagulls and ate them raw as well. They drank seawater that almost killed them. They were so sunburned that the blisters would burst and burn again. They drifted, but then were finally picked up by a ship, but it happened to be a Japanese ship. He was sent to Japan, and he sent to a work camp unknown to the Americans. They kept him secret, because they didn't have to treat their prisoners according to the Geneva Convention. And Zamperini received harsh treatment. One of the things that had happened to him in his life, he had been one of the sprinters in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. And he almost won. And when one of the guards learned of it, he taunted him. And he told him he needed to run as fast as he could. But as he stood up, the guard smashed his leg with a stick, and he was forced to run with two broken legs. His camp was close to a place called Nagasaki. One day, a lone bomber made a lazy circle over a distant city and evaporated in an atomic bomb blast. And so after so many years, So much mistreatment, Louis Zamperini climbed onto a plane that one day would touch down in Bakersfield, California. The bottom of the ramp was a mother who hugged him and a sweetheart who wept. After all the pain of living in a foreign land, he was home. One day, we will be as well. Thank you for joining me. I hope to see you again next week as we continue our study in 1 Peter.